My name's Andrew McColl. I'm the Queensland Director of Family Voice. And it's my pleasure to welcome Martin Isles to our Family Voice Zoom session today. Martin is the Executive CEO of Answers in Genesis in the US. Good morning, Martin. Good morning, Andrew. Good to be with you and everybody who's joining us. So just a bit of housekeeping for all of the listeners today. There will be opportunity for viewers' questions nearing the end of our Zoom session today. If you have one, simply go online with that and my colleague Peter Downey will moderate those for us. So Martin, you've made the transition from ACL or Australian Christian Lobby to Answers in Genesis last year and you've moved to the US. I'm assuming that's much less political and your work is different. Is that correct? Yes, I would say uh, my role is definitely less political in the direct sense, so I'm not lobbying. Uh, but it's interesting, the apologetics issues of the day are very political in nature. So uh, politics is really centering around culture wars in a big way. Uh, you can look at any of the hot button issues in the political space right now, from the gender stuff through to other LGBT issues, climate issues, pro-life issues, race-based politics and those sorts of issues, and, and so on and so on. And it's really interesting. What Those are the sort of part of the political debate that we really care about, uh, but they're also the apologetics debate. I mean, those are the issues that the world is throwing up in the face of Christians and saying, uh, look how bigoted you are on these issues. You have no answer for this sort of thing. And so my political background has been a really good preparation for where apologetics is right now in the Western world. Right. And we know, too, that the US population is almost 13 times that of Australia. So I'm assuming there must be a far greater Christian presence for you over there. There is a very significant Christian presence. However, uh, I've been a little shocked by how shallow the Christianity is here, even compared to Australia. Um, uh, there's a lot of cultural baggage that is Christian in the States. And, you know, in Australia, it's getting to the point, especially if you're a younger person, where to identify yourself openly as a Christian, it's a, it can be a risky thing to do now in Australia. Um, the, the culture does not generally receive that well, whereas over here, they don't have that kind of, not, depends where you live and it depends what your demographics are, but that kind of re cultural reproach is not as strong in the US at all. In fact, it's, it's quite culturally acceptable in many parts of the country. And as a result, um, you don't have that same level of conviction behind the claim to be a Christian. And so a lot of people make those claims without the conviction and the seriousness that I think especially younger generations in Australia have. Uh, and so there is a lot of Christianity here. How much of it is real, genuine, deep-rooted faith? Good question. Don't know. <laughs> I, I suppose there, there is and there was commonality for you in both tasks, whether you're working for Answers in Genesis or ACL, you were called then and you're called now to apply scripture to culture and society and to teach Christians. Yes, exactly. So, you know, I never said this at ACL because I was more in the political context, but really what I was doing was driven by um, a conviction that scripture was sufficient to answer uh, the issues of today, the culture today, that we had the blueprints there. Uh, and it's really interesting with the the download programs that uh, we used to, that, well, they still run them, ACL do. And uh, when I was a part of that, I found myself teaching a series called Genesis Blueprints uh, to bring the scriptural foundations from Genesis, actually, to the cultural issues of the day and to form the worldview of the young folks that went. And they found that incredibly powerful. Uh, and so it's weird how the Lord works. Uh, now I'm in a situation where, uh, I mean, I'm now talking openly about the fact that there are Genesis blueprints for these issues. And it's the same thing. It's the sufficiency of scripture to answer the issues of the day. Um, and, um, uh, and and that's really what, 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 what drives me. Good, good. Well, I've been blessed to read your book, Martin, uh, called Who Am I? And I'll be reading some quotes from the book to uh, Martin. And I've got about eight to read to him, one after the other. He'll I'll read one and he'll comment and we'll go to the next one. And so Martin can just comment on what he's written. And I've 
I've chosen, as I said, eight. I'd, I'd, I'd chosen about 35 or 40, but I had to get them down in number to, to be able to fit them into the schedule that we have. So I'll start with the first one, Martin, and um, leave you to go with that. And so the first one goes like this. A television reporter once challenged me that it was hateful to assert that a sinner would go to hell, to which I responded, the day I found out I was a sinner going to hell was one of the best days of my life, and it was because it turned me once and for all away from the false foundation and slavery of self in all its poverty and corruption. It made me hate the sin that lived within me. It made me look outside myself to another foundation. It made me crave the righteousness of God. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So that uh, that happened twice, actually, where I, I had I gave an answer very similar to that, where I said the day I found out I was a sinner going to hell was the best day of my life. And both of them were in response to the Israel Folau issue where he had posted that sinners would go to hell. Um, and the reporter obviously challenged me with the notion that that was hateful. That was hate speech. Um, and it's interesting uh, the, the way it intersects with the identity issue, the who am I question. Uh, is that today, young people in particular, but generally in the culture, um, there there is this message targeting us that says that the self uh, is good, um, or that the self is really the foundation for um, for um, our worldview. So uh, you think of identity politics, what does it come back to? The self. Uh, it's politics, but it's all about my sexual identity, my gender, my gender identity, my uh, my personality type, this, that, and the other. And if I'm a particular sexual orientation, a particular cultural background, a particular gender identity, then I have visibility on all the ways in which the culture and the society are oppressing me, a visibility that others that don't have my identity can't see. And so therefore I go into the public squares and the political system and I wage war against, against all the oppression that I can see because of who I am. You see, it all comes down to who I am. Uh, and you go to uh, schools, particularly public schools in Australia, and the teaching from a very young age is that uh, who you are, uh, what it is that comes out of your subjective self, you know, the way you feel about yourself, the, the self introspection that you that you have, your your feelings and desires, all of that really is the blueprint for you to work out who you are, and therefore uh, the sorts of things you should pursue in life. Um, and of course. That goes all the way up to the level of the pride movement, where it says, well, who I am is what I should pursue, what I should celebrate, even if it's, you know, sexually perverse, or even if it's particular gender that doesn't accord with my biological sex, uh, I should, I should chase after all of these things, this is the meaning of life, and what, it all comes back to the self, again, it's always the self. <clears throat> and the thing I challenge in the book is I say, well, hang on, you know, is this, is this a good cultural shift or a bad one? It's very easy to find out. Uh, you only need to ask, is the self good or bad? <laughs> and and if the self is good, then great, we're on a good path. But if the self is bad, then we're in big trouble. And of course, we know that uh, for all the good people may do, the self ultimately is a, a petri dish of sin. Uh, and Jesus said that which comes out of the heart is what defiles the person. And he lists all the sins that live there. Uh, and, you know, this identity theory of life is immunizing a generation against the gospel because the gospel comes to them and says, you are a sinner. And they say, no, self is the foundation for how to live. Self is where I find uh, all my value systems. Self is, is what I live from. And we say, no, don't live from self. Self is bad. Uh, and so this identity theory of life is an attack on the gospel. And that's what I'm challenging. And I say, actually, if young people could find out that the self is not good, that's not hateful. That's giving them really the answer to their problems. That's giving them the the the, the better path, uh, which is to turn away from self. Uh, and obviously, where do you turn to? Well, we know that you turn to Jesus Christ. Excellent. You write that quote: "The more we know about God, the more we discover who we ought to be, and the more we want to be that person." When we see what God has done, we are burdened with a sense of debt and duty desiring to serve him. When we learn what God is like, we see a blueprint of what we should be like. The Christian life is a life marked by an increasing knowledge of God and a resulting increase in holy character and righteous actions. Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, when the world around us asks the identity question, when they say, who am I? 
uh, they 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 look they look within. I, I sort of make the point that it provokes us to look at ourselves straight away. You know, who am I? Oh, let me look at myself and find out. Ask, how do I feel? What do I like? What what do I dislike? What's my personality type? What's my uh, sexuality? What's this and that and the other? Uh, we look within ourselves by default, and the point I make is that that's that's where we go wrong, <laughs> because you've got to consider a few things, and 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 one of them is that Genesis one twenty seven makes it very clear that we were made to bear God's image. Uh, in other words, uh, uh, if you want to find out who you are or who you ought to be, is probably a better way to put it, um, it's not really about you. It's about God's image. It's about who God is. Uh, and the way I conclude the book is to say, you know, there's a sense in which the, the question, who am I, is the wrong question for creatures who are made to bear God's image. Uh, the right question is, who is God? Uh, because if we're made to bear his image, we need to find out who he is, know him, and as we grow in the knowledge of him and the understanding of what he is like and what he has done, so we become more of who we're meant to be. But it's all about looking to God. Uh, that's the key point. So uh, I, I finish the book really by saying wrong question. It's not who am I. <laughs> it's, 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 it's who is God. Um, and, and, and there you'll find start to find some of the answers. And of course, we know that God is revealed to us today in Jesus Christ. So uh, that's, 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 that's really where that all goes. But um, uh, uh, we need to, uh, you know, I'm named after Martin Lloyd-Jones, and he used to always use this phrase. He said, we have a morbid obsession with ourselves. Uh, and I think one of the one of the key things for the Christian is to get over that. One of the major pieces of our sanctification is to stop looking at ourselves uh, in a world where it really is all about yourself. And uh, we are guided by our wants, our desires, our feelings, our psychology. Uh, we're so introspective. That's not what the Christian is called to be principally. Uh, the Christian is called to something higher, something greater. We, we're we ones who don't look inside, we look outside. We look to God. Yeah. You mentioned that to be made with dominion means we were made to rule the world. That doesn't mean we were all meant to be kings and warlords. Rather, it means we were made with enough authority to put a stamp on whichever corner or sphere of the world that God gives us. We are like trustees. We appear to have a lot of authority and we appear to be in charge, but we are ultimately accountable to the God who owns all things and put us in charge to act according to his interests. Yeah, uh, I mean... If I talk in the dominion section about the fact that God established, God gave people, human beings, authority uh, in the world. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, in the New Testament, you actually find a number of categories of authority that is specifically outlined. Government authority, there's authority structures in families, uh, and there's um, uh, there's authority structures in churches and things like that. So authority is, is, is good. But the, the point being, um, what is it supposed to be? Um, like what is, what is and, and the problem we have today is that people are actually ruling out of their own authority. They're ruling for themselves. Uh, they're ruling according to what they think uh, is right or in self-interest. Um, and that's destroying us. Uh, if you have basically narcissistic people who look into themselves in, with authority, um, then that's destructive. Um, because all authority on hev in heaven and on earth is given to, to, to Christ. Um, and authority ultimately is not ours. And, and Romans 13 teaches even a governing authority. It's God's. God gives it. And the point I make in the book is exactly that. Uh, and in Genesis, where dominion is given to Adam and Eve, um, God has given that dominion. It's his authority. It's not just theirs. Um, and uh, I use the example of the trust, where a trustee is appointed and the trustee is put in charge of something, usually money. But the trustee has a duty, and that is to use the money or to use whatever it is that's in the trust uh, in the best interests of the true owner, which is not the trustee. It's the person who established the trust. Uh, and uh, it's like that with God. He gives us authority over certain things in this life and in this world. Uh, he makes us the kind of people who leave a mark on this world in some way. Uh, and the point being, uh, we're only going to... Uh, acquit that responsibility well insofar as we're submitted to God, insofar as we are acting in his interests, not our own. Um, and that's the point I make about dominion. Excellent. 
And uh, you mentioned that uh, the, the truth is men and women are both human. With respect to anything that is true of us as humans, we are the same. We are equal. But there are things which are not true of us as humans. Some things are true of us as men. Other things are true of us as women. In these matters, we are not the same. We are not equal. The most glaringly obvious example of inequality or difference is childbirth. Men and women are not equal in their relationship to that truth. Only biological women give birth. Yeah, this is. A, I'm talking about equality here because there's a section in the book on gender, as there has to be if you're writing a book on identity. You've got to have a gender chapter, which is probably I think it's the longest or the second longest chapter in the book, probably the longest, because uh, it's it's sort of the centre of the debate. And I, I, I address equality first, and you know people always say men and women are equal, and I say well let's just investigate what we mean. You know, there's a sense in which a skateboard and a sports car are equal because they're both modes of transportation with four wheels. They, they've got an equality. They're the same in respect of something. Uh, they're equal in terms of that, that truth, but they're not equal. They're not the same. They're different. And it's the same with men and women, where, where there are certain truths with respect to which we are the same. Uh, for example, we're made in God's image. We're the same in that. Uh, for example, uh, the gospel applies, Galatians um, makes it very clear that uh, in the matter of salvation or the gospel of Jesus Christ, there's neither male nor female, right? The gospel is yep. equally full. Uh, our sanctification, you know, all that, spiritual life, etc. cetera. It's, it, we're, the, we're equal in respect to those truths, but there is some truth in respect <laughs> to which, like that skateboard and sports car, we're just not the same. Uh, and I want to make that point. And I want to make that point in a way that goes beyond uh the answers we've seen recently so uh, those who are sort of watching the 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 issues in the culture will know that the whole what is a woman thing uh was a really big question going around and uh, you know most on the conservative side sort of answered that question by saying a woman is a adult human female and fine that's totally true uh but i want to go beyond that i want to say well okay uh a woman is those things, but is she more than that? Is there something uh, called femininity? Is there something beyond her biological pieces that 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 is that is a question of who she is uh, that that defines her? And is it the same for men? Is there such a thing as masculinity? Is a man got something placed within him that's beyond his mere biology that makes him a man? And I think we know the answer is yes, but not many people want to sort of go there. Uh, and I do go there in the book. And I go there in the book by saying, well, let's be real about our differences just for a second uh, and see and see what they're supposed to be, because we've lost sight of that for decades now. Uh, and in Genesis chapter two, there are blueprints given there for uh, differences between men and women in light of our equality, of course, which is ultimate, but differences uh, in terms of the way the things God fitted us for in our creation mandates. And I go through the words worker, keeper, helper, mother, and I show how that they uh, help to define what is a woman in terms of femininity and what is a man in terms of masculinity uh, and how those things uh, we're called to sort of exercise them in order to bring a certain impact on God's world. Yeah, so you mentioned that uh, masculinity and femininity are mysterious in some ways and hard to define, but God has placed the potential for them within men and women, respectively. They exist to empower and energize those virtues which interact with masculinity or femininity. In this way, they bring a good impact to the world, which is otherwise lost, where masculinity and femininity are weak, absent or despised yeah so that's 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 a good follow-on from what i was just saying um so the point i make because people because if you look in genesis and you see well a man is made uh and then he's given two words to commission him in his creation mandate and then the need for a woman is observed and the woman is made and then a word is given to her to commission her in her creation mandate uh, and you look at those words and you say, okay, well, what did God mean for the man to do? And what did God mean for the woman to do? And what does that tell us about who we are? Um, and in the case of the man, he's made there to work and to keep. Uh, and I point out 
um, that the man is made with, uh, you know, the word work in the Hebrew is really to labor in service. So he's he's made to do a task that is beyond himself, higher than himself. To he's called to industry. He's called to uh, to to do an, some industry in the world which is for a higher call or a higher purpose. And yeah. I say, well, there's lots of ways. You know, for Adam, it was his wife and his family and his garden. And really, a lot of men have exactly the same <laughs> responsibility, right? <laughs> uh, and but you know, there's there's other things as well. Um, uh, you know, you can do things for the kingdom of God. You can do things that uh, build and uphold the pillars of culture and institutions, and so on. And let's take that as one example. And then and then the other thing, the man, the keep thing, is actually really about a responsibility for the preservation, for the saving, for the defense of 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 the place God put him. And all men have a place that God has put him. At least they have a family or something like that. Um, and, and there's a spiritual responsibility for the spiritual preservation and the spiritual defense of that place that God has put him in. And that was really Adam's responsibility. That's why he's held responsible throughout all history for the fall, because it was on him. Ultimately, the buck stopped with him to say, make sure the word of God is upheld in the area of your responsibility. And people will come back and say, well, are you saying that women shouldn't be responsible and the women can't work? No, I'm not. <laughs> and then they say, well, what are you saying? And that's where this quote comes in, uh, where I say, well, what I am saying is that, um, you know, these words are not sort of hard limits on either of the sexes, but they are supposed to show us, um, they are supposed to show us those things that interact with masculinity in a peculiar way. Uh, and that therefore um, show us what men can focus on in order to bring an impact to the world that is amplified by their masculinity. So when men step up to the plate on those things, there is an impact that is brought with that, uh, which is amplified by the fact that they have something in their being called masculinity. Um, and women have slightly different things. And the point is we're sp both supposed to step up to the plate to acknowledge that there is masculinity, there is femininity, and there are certain things we can do that are amplified in their impact because of our masculinity and femininity. And when we work together in that way, actually we see God's will done in very powerful ways. Uh, and to neglect masculinity and femininity is a huge mistake because there's certain virtues that will lose their impact in the world. Absolutely. Well, probably the quote that you were referring to was when I was, I was going, to read, going to read to you. Oh, anyway. yeah. Yeah. Getting ahead of you. <laughs> which was Adam's responsibility was firstly spiritual. His ultimate accountability was spiritual. His legacy was spiritual. Actually, the responsibilities he had at their root could be summarized in this way. He was responsible to ensure that the word of God was applied in his sphere of responsibility. His failure was a failure to lead in that respect. He allowed God's word to be questioned and undermined. He subjected it to critique. He disobeyed it. He watched Eve disobey too. He failed to resist these things. And this is the true battle in every society, every generation, and every era. It is the battle of good versus evil, truth versus lies, and God versus Satan. It is a battle for the souls of men, women, and children. It is a fight to the death against evil. So it's... A, an onward march of righteousness. Yes, and I particularly point that out because one of the things I've, there's been a bit of a resurgence of books and materials on sort of what is masculinity, especially in the Christian world, because we've we've forgotten. We, we, just, we just don't know. It's been erased from our cultural memory. Uh, and um, what I noticed was that there was a little bit of confusion sometimes where they would kind of connect masculinity with kind of like big muscles and, uh, you know, uh, uh, physicality <clears throat> and strength, physical strength and all this kind of stuff. And uh, you know, I make the point of the book, well, what about a man who uh, is not athletic? What about a man who doesn't have big muscles? What about a man who works in an office? Is he less masculine? And of course, the answer is no. And the reason is that, um, you know, it's not you know, that ultimately what masculinity was about in the Garden of Eden was not first those things. It was first spiritual. It was first to say, you know what, um, there is somebody who is going to be held spiritually accountable for what happens in this place. 
Somebody is going to have to give it an answer to God for how God's word is upheld in this place. And that somebody is the man. That somebody is going to be Adam. And when Adam fails in that, his name is attached to the fall. I mean, Eve eats first, Adam goes second. Adam, it's in Adam all die. By one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. Um, and God, when he comes searching for Adam and Eve in the garden, he says, where are you, Adam? And the you is singular. He's looking for the man to address it to him. It's not to say women are irresponsible. That would deny their agency. But it is to say that there is something that God expects of men in relation to the broader spiritual defense of their areas of responsibility. Uh, and that is why the Bible teaches... <clears throat> Um, sort of the spiritual headship of fathers in the home. Uh, that is why if you look at the way God works throughout scripture, you can look at patriarchs and apostles and prophets and priests and all that. You know, it, it's typically male. Um, and the point I make is that we know there are many things that women can do that men struggle to do as well as women. You know, the old joke is multitasking, but there's more profound things than that as well, that women just do better than men and men struggle to replicate it. And I asked the question in the book, OK, what's the thing that men do that women struggle to replicate? What is it that's sort of that, that men are particularly effective at? And I make the point that it is it is that men have an impact, a spiritual impact for good or evil. So they could be irresponsible and have a bad <laughs> spiritual impact or they could be responsible and have a good spiritual impact. But that spiritual impact on their times, you know, the men of a particular generation will have a spiritual impact on that era uh, that women will struggle to replicate if the men don't step up and if the men fail in that responsibility. Um, and uh, that's the point that I make, because we always talk about what is a woman, what is femininity. I think young men everywhere are, are in a crisis of their own of relevance, and they need to be given some of these truths to say, you know what, here's a responsibility that you have. And of course, that particular responsibility tells a young man, get off YouTube, uh, stop chilling out, just sitting around chilling and partying, stop <laughs> wasting away your hours and start reading your Bible and start studying the scriptures because you have a particular kind of spiritual responsibility that you will give an answer for because you're a man. Um, and um, yeah, that's, that's what I teach uh, to young people and that's what's in the book. Excellent. Well, that's that's a great uh, way of looking at how you know men are designed and formed. And you'd written about women, saying that uh, when the woman is made second, she's commissioned with a single word which describes her God-given purpose as a woman. She's commissioned as helper. This charge is given to her concerning the man, which speaks of a focus towards persons. Then, in the following chapter, she's described as mother. The Hebrew word translated helper is Aza, A-Y-Z-E-R. It means the sucker, which is an antiquated but very good word. It's shades of meaning are to render strength, enablement, support, and aid. It may contain a suggestion of an alliance. In a world where power and self-advancement are highly coveted, this strikes some people as demeaning, but God describes himself with the same word in other parts of Scripture so he clearly does not agree. His values system is not the same as ours. Yes. So this is the other side of the coin. If if we've looked at some of those particular points which interact with masculinity, what are the particular points that interact with femininity? And the first one there is uh, that God made the woman with a very, very clear commission. Uh, and the word is helper. Or uh, interestingly, in Australia, people tend to know that old word sucker, S-U-C-C-O-U-R. It sounds funny, but uh, they tend to know it. In America, I found it's very hard to find people who have heard of that word. So I have to explain it. It's a great word. And that's probably one of the best translations of it. But we don't use it, obviously, because um, uh, it, 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 it's antiquated. Um, and, you know, what it, what it shows is that, and we know this, actually, uh, from, from just modern psychology and our <clears throat> understanding of sexes, which you would expect to generally accord with, we're fallen, so it wouldn't be perfect, but to generally accord with the creation design. We know that women have a particular gifting uh, and a particular interest in the interpersonal. Uh, and I've certainly just discerned this from all my travels and speaking and, and interacting with people. Women are very interested in sometimes even fascinated by the person. Uh, and they, they always want to know what's making, what's going on in, the, in, in a person's mind. 
Um, and in a way that I don't pick up in the same way from men, but we know this, we know this from psychological studies. I mean, Jordan Peterson has made this very, very apparent in, in, in work that he explains. Uh, and it's also seen in novels. I mean, uh, why has Jane Austen been so popular among women down through the ages? It's because the relationship is the center of the story. Uh, it's because it's, you know, he loves her, he doesn't love her. Uh, oh dear, now there's somebody else that he likes. What's going to happen next? You know, and then it's like, oh, they love each other again. You know, they live happily ever after. The, 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 the relationship is the plot. Um, and women have a gifting here. They can, you, you think of the phrase, a woman's intuition. There's a lot of truth in that. Uh, women can discern uh, people and interpersonal things in a way that sees past the words that they may actually speak. Um, they can discern um, deficiencies in a person. They can sort of perceive anxieties that are below the surface. Um, they can anticipate needs and intercede for them. There's a gifting there that a woman has, which will always, generally speaking, surpass the male equivalent. <clears throat> Um, and so there's a commissioning there, which is interpersonal. Um, and I point that out. Uh, and obviously, in the direct context of Genesis 2, uh, Eve has a husband, and that's that's where that is applied most powerfully. But I just point out that that's not the only application, because not every woman marries in, in today's world, and sometimes despite best intentions. Um, but there is something there which enables her to be one who renders strength and aid and support and nurture to others. Uh, and if she doesn't find ways to do that, um, she's not bringing her unique feminine power into, into the world. Uh, no amount of masculinity will make up for that. Um, and that's one of the differences I point out. Yes. Well, you mentioned too, uh, Martin, that the, the woman was at her best when making another person their best. That was her commission. And it spills over into her motherhood too. Only women are mothers. And this is a good and beautiful thing indeed from God, for which she's designed biologically, psychologically, and spiritually. When God called the woman a helper to succor another, he told us something about her femininity. It is something that matches with the findings of modern psychology, namely that women tend to have special special abilities in the interpersonal realm. The phrase, a woman's intuition has a basis in reality. Yes. Uh, I don't know if there's another quote about the mother thing, but um, uh, I, I might I might touch on that if, 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 if not. Sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, I mean... Um, I just point something out, which is, uh, which is that of all the things that um, sort of God affirms about women in the Bible, the fact that they are mothers, uh, I, I think I think I'm comfortable to say it's it's number one, um, and I say that for a few reasons. Uh, the first thing ever said about the gospel is something related to a mother, Genesis three fifteen: the seed of the woman shall crush the head of the serpent. So God places motherhood dead center of, of the whole plan of redemption for history. Yeah. It's interesting, we live in a time when, you know, being a mother is increasingly not that well regarded. Um, you know, you think of people say, well, I'm just a mum. You know, that's a common thing that you hear. Um, and uh, I think certainly in my generation and below, there's been a big push to say, you know, this is going to disempower you. This is going to um, lead you down a path that, that, that stops your sort of self a fulfillment. Um, and, but actually, that's not God's view. Uh, and, you know, he put motherhood right at the center of the gospel itself. Um, and also what you find throughout history is that kind of, you know, the fact that the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent, Jesus will come and he will destroy and he'll be born of a woman and he'll destroy Satan. That's the ultimate fulfillment of Genesis 3.15. But you see some kind of shadows of it all through the Bible. Uh, you think of the era of the judges, one of the darkest periods of human history, uh, when everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And the book of Judges finishes with probably the worst chapter in the whole Bible. Um, and you think, well, what happened? How did how did God turn things around? Well, um, the, Hannah prayed for a son, right? Um, and dedicated him to God. Uh, and God raised up a, a son, a child. Uh, or he raised up a woman to pray for a child and use the child to change things. Same in the days of slavery in Egypt. Uh, you've got, um, you know, the, the decree goes out from Pharaoh that the, the Hebrew boys are to be, you know, killed uh, in childbirth and they're done <laughs> times. 
people of God have been in slavery for years. The, the burden is very heavy. Uh, you know, why would you have kids in that sort of environment? Well, because that's that's where the hope of the earth comes from, always has. Uh, and God affirms the Jochebed who hides a child in the bulrushes. And weirdly, in God's providence, because of the decree that Pharaoh had made, um, that child grows up in Pharaoh's own household <laughs> because his daughter finds it, saves it, and that equips him to be the guy who frees God's people and is one of the greatest uh, men of all of history. Uh, and, you know, you think of Queen Esther, uh, and, and again, you know, the hope from uh, a, a man, Mordecai, who raised her uh, and prayed for mm -hmm. her. Uh, and we're in this world where um, there is just a bewildering array of attacks against motherhood, uh, ideological, spiritual, you even just think of abortion and the rate that that is at. Um, and, you know, I, I just think um, uh, Satan knows how powerful it is because he was there when God said, I will save the world in this way. Um, and I also wonder, and I make this comment in the book, I don't know if it's in one of your quotes, but um, I make the comment that I just have a suspicion that he he not only feared motherhood for a long time, and that's why he got Herod to put out that decree to kill the boys and, and Pharaoh as well. And he not only feared it because he knew it would be his end, uh, but I, I just wonder whether today he's um, he's got a desire for revenge as well, because uh, you think of how proud he was, is um, swollen with pride, you know, mighty in power. And God says, I'm going to take what the world despises. I'm going to take a young, poor Hebrew woman, a mother, and from her is going to come the one that will destroy you. And it happened. And I look at the way in which women are attacked. You think transgenderism overwhelmingly is present in young girls more than young boys uh, and how they're destroying themselves uh, with surgeries and all the rest of it. Uh, you think of abortion uh, and just the way that's absolutely out of control and the deranged uh, um, sort of um, support that that receives uh, from so many quarters as an empowerment thing. And then you think of the way in which this whole generation just, you know, getting married, being a mum, that kind of thing, it just is not cool. Uh, and it is probably oppressive and, you know, it's risky uh, and all this, and it'll compromise your empowerment. Uh, you know, there's a bewildering array of attacks on this very thing that God has called great about women. Um, and uh, I just wonder whether there's a revenge piece there. Uh, but um, uh, it, it's good for us to go back and see what God has affirmed uh, in days like this. Otherwise, we'll get uh, we'll lose sight of it. Yeah, well, th thank you. Thank you, Martin, for those comments. I've, I found your book excellent, very encouraging for me as a father and as a grandfather to understand more about both masculinity and femininity and make us to, or be challenged us men to think more about the sort of qualities that women do bring with them. So thank you so much for your book. So just uh, changing changing tack for a moment i want to go over to peter and ask him if he has any listeners uh, some some questions martin from our listeners thank you peter um, yes i do uh, andrew uh, the first one's from uh, dita uh, how do i respond to a minister or anybody who says to stay away from politics and concentrate on preaching the gospel yeah i mean what i would sort of say is well if a politician puts something from the Bible into politics, does that mean that we should respond by ignoring it? Um, is that really what we believe? That just because a politician says something that is answered in the Bible, we should not preach that part of the Bible. We should not speak of that part of the Bible. Is that how we define a minister's role? Is that how we define the church's role? The obvious answer is no, because that's what that is doing. You know, it may well, be, like, I agree that it's not necessarily a good idea for a minister to get involved in party politics. It's not necessarily a good idea for ministers to get involved in political personalities and all that. But you think of the issues that are now present in politics. They are issues that are biblical. Uh, they are issues that are answered in creation. Uh, the, we just talked all about gender. I mean, the trans thing. Uh, you know, ministers won't touch this stuff with a barge pole because they're afraid of it and they're afraid that people will get upset. And I sit there and go, OK, so just because that's gone into the political world, you're now going to avoid it. Um, I think that's a rejection of one's responsibility. 
uh, especially because the fact that it is in the political world means that people are asking questions about it. And the Bible is where the answers are. So I, I believe that we need to address the uh, issues of the day uh, as they interact with what Scripture teaches. Uh, and that's not being political, that's being biblical. Uh, and we shouldn't allow politicians to take that away from us just because they're talking about it as well. In fact, that's all the more reason for us to talk about it. Yeah, thank you, Martin. <clears throat> I've got a question here. What was your most successful strategy uh, to produce good uh, when you were the national director of ACL? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, you know, 